Hey there, folks. Welcome back. People always joke around with me, like, Eric, everybody you have on your program, you say they're your friend. Well, usually that's just true. Uh, and in some cases, it's dramatically true, as in the case of my guest today, George Saris. George and I have been friends for a thousand years. I don't know. George, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. But we've been, I mean, look, we've been friends at least for 23 years, I think. I think... I, I, I don't remember when I first met you, but we were part of that Bible study, the Master right. Media Bible study, right. which began about 2000, I think. Yeah, it actually began a little before that. Yes. Um, but not too much before that. Yeah, yeah right around that time. Anyway, yeah. but we've been friends for a long time, and you, um, you're tough to sum up. The reason you're on the program today is because you've written a wonderful book called Searching for Truth in Hollywood and Bethlehem. And Vegas. And Vegas. Right. The quest to discover if God is real. Now, you, um, to sum you up, I mean, you are, uh, you've had a career as a voiceover actor. You've done voiceovers for, oh my gosh, like all these huge corporations. So people have heard you. You've got that kind of a voice. Well, thank you very much. Actually, um, if people want to uh, listen to, they don't have to listen to it, but if they want to hear the Bible, you can go on BibleGateway.com, and I narrated the NIV 2011 version. You can get that for free, and you can hear me, you yes. can hear me read Leviticus chapter 3, verse 25, if and you no, want to. Listen, it's so funny. I was just <laughs> going to say to that, you've, and, and then the ultimate uh, is when I go to the audio Bible, uh, I, I can choose between two people that are friends, Max McLean or George Saris. I mean, this is nuts, but it's totally true. Uh, and don't tell Max, I prefer your reading. Thank you for Don't much. tell Max, please, <laughs> don't tell him. No, but George, uh, honestly, it's amazing. So you, you've done tons of voiceover stuff, and it really is your voice uh, at Bible Gateway. Um, but you're, uh, you know, you're not just an actor. Uh, you, you've written books. Uh, I want to talk to you about this book. You care about truth and God. And um, but uh, you also, over the years, have done a one-man show. Talk about that a little bit, because I've seen you do pieces of it uh, yeah. before we get into the, the book, Searching for Truth. Yeah, my one-man show, um, back in 1983, I think, um, I was doing a commercial for a storyteller in Boston, and uh, he had a one-man show at a theater, and, I th and they asked me if I wanted to have a couple of tickets to his performance. I right, thought, I've right. never seen a one-man show. I don't know what a one-man show is. Anyway, this man stood on stage. He had a box, a broom, and an apron. And for two hours, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, it was enthralling. And the first thought that came to my mind was, I wonder if that approach would work with Scripture. And so I decided to memorize some passages of Scripture, apply the technique that I saw him use, which was pantomiming some actions, use very, very small amount of uh, props and uh, just do it. And so uh, it turned out to be tremendously successful. I actually have uh, six audio CDs of Bible stories that uh, I have done um, with music and sound effects, but it's all straight scripture. The uh, CDs are available in either the original NIV or the uh, King James Version. And, uh, and then I have performed it for many, many times uh, over the years. Well, if the King James Version was good enough for St. Paul, it should be good enough for us, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and George, uh, people can find you online at georgesaris.com. I don't remember it's where it George was. georgewsaris.com. George W. Saris, S-A-R-R-I-S, Greek. That's, That's right. That's how we first connected. I thought, here's a guy who believes in, in the Bible and Jesus, and he's a Christian, and he's also got a Greek background, and so that's where we first connected. Well, look, we're here to talk about your new book, Searching for Truth in Hollywood and in, Bethlehem. In, in Vegas. And, and Vegas. And, yeah, here, you can have this one. doesn't in, have the... In, in, oh, you know what? One. No, I see it here because right. I, have, I have an older version of the book, so thank you. I'll trade you. But, um, <clears throat> but you and I care about truth, and we care about communicating the truth of God on a simple level so that everybody can understand, yes, 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 it's actually true. Mm. Um, so what do you cover about, uh, what do you cover in this book titled Search for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem? Well, what I found is that people today are crying out for truth. They, uh, everything is inauthentic. 
You know, they, they can't trust the schools. They can't trust the government. They can't trust even their churches a lot of times. I think that's one of the reasons why you wrote letters to the churches, oh, man. Uh, to the Christian church. I'm sorry to say that's correct. Right. And so they're looking for truth. And so are the questions uh, of life answered in Vegas, which is represented chance, evolution? In other words, are we just a chance mixing of elements that um, uh, appear today, we die, and that's it? There's nothing else. Um, is it in Hollywood, which is representative of the force of Star Wars, Eastern mysticism, um, are we going to die and become part of a, uh, a life force that exists out there and lose our individuality, that we become basically nothing? So the, the people that believe in chance become insignificant. The people that be, believe in uh, the force become nothing. Or are we going to become... Uh, are, are we a, uh, a creation of an all-powerful, all-wise creator? But if that's true, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? And if that's, the, that's the ultimate question, that's which correct. everyone will always ask. In other words, even, even if you come to believe in the God of the Bible as we have, you still, of course, uh, have good questions, and, and it's just that those questions don't overwhelm the truth of your faith because you realize, well, I know enough about God and about how much He loves me and how good He is that uh, even though I have questions, it, the, the questions cannot, cannot tear me away from what I know. But it's important to have answers to that. And this book really has been designed not for the Christian audience per particularly. Uh, it's actually designed for non-Christians, interestingly. Uh, I've been in the media industry uh, as an actor, as a voiceover spokesman for f over 40 years. And during that time, I've had many, many conversations with people about God, about right. uh, the Bible. Uh, some people believe that, you know, how could you be so stupid, George, to believe that there actually is a God? Others were kind of wondering, you know, I got sort of this interest in God, but I I'm not sure about the Bible. And then you got a bunch of people that are Christians, but they still have significant answers. And over the years, I wanted to have some book I could give to them. I didn't find any that I really liked, and so I finally decided to write one. Well, I love the idea that you are breaking this up. Uh, in other words, it's, um, you know, to say, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, <laughs> you're giving us a way into these three modes, basically, right? And other people have written uh, similar things. I think of uh, Tom... Thomas Howard, who wrote his book, Chance of the Dance, 1969. Mm. But that's a very kind of highfalutin, very literary way into this. And he only deals with two of these ideas. But l let's, let's get into it. Actually, before we get into it, I just want to uh, say again that I, I think you and I, we bump into people all the time that have basic questions. And the culture is not giving them answers. And they're kind of, they've kind of become convinced that there are no answers, so they sort of stop asking, and they just kind of go with the flow. Right. But you know and I know that there are answers to this. And so in this book, you have those kinds of answers, and it is the kind of thing you can give to somebody who says, like, what about this? What about this? Well, read this book. Uh, so when you say Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, let's go through these three different ways of seeing things. So you use Vegas to say... It's a crapshoot. It's completely random. Right. Um, which, I mean, I've written about this in some of my books. It's if you actually follow that through to the bottom, that is deeply nihilistic and sick. But most people forget that. They just they they don't they don't follow it through to the bottom. They just go ah everything's just random and the universe came uh, into being through random processes and whatever. So t talk about that worldview. Yeah, I, uh, I, I try to come up with three basic uh, reasons that evolution is wrong. Um, what I say is that uh, evolution uh, is contrary to the basic laws of science, and I point out the law of second dynamic. Uh, uh, Actually, second okay, that's the first one. The second uh, law of thermodynamics. Right. And, 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 and you're right. The idea that science says, oh, we order emerged out of disorder. It just happened. And you think, well, wait a second. That's a really high bar. I mean, really? Because you're telling me it never happens, but except in this one time it happened. 
I was on the subway <laughs> a long time ago when I was working on this book, actually, originally. And um, I saw a sign up on the subway. It said it was for a technical school. It said, things break. That's why we always need skilled technicians. You don't drive a car and expect that it's going to get better. In fact, yesterday, my wife came and said, George, the car is running really rough. And it's not running on all the cylinders. Yeah. Um, things don't get better. They actually get worse. They break down. They break down over it's time. It's called entropy. And it right. proves, OK, we're out of time. We'll be right back. We're talking to George <laughs> Saris. You can find him at George W. Saris, S-A-R-R-I-S, George W. Saris.com. The new book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Folks, welcome back. Talking to my friend George Saris, the new book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So the Vegas idea is everything's random, and people actually say that the whole universe and life and human beings emerged from nothingness, from randomness, by itself, kind of created itself or, or whatever. And you were just talking about how in real life we know that never happens. Our cars break down. They, we they, die. They, they, People we die. die. We, really? Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. Everything f goes bad yeah. <laughs> at the end. Right. Kind of falls apart. And so most people know that that's the, that's the way it is. So the idea that we're supposed to say yes, but except in the case of uh, evolution um, where it just happened to work in the other direction. But, you know, to be fair, mm -hmm. I can understand how people could buy that idea. Because when you talk about natural selection, you know, you, you, we've all heard it in school that, okay, you know, the giraffe with the longest neck – uh, can reach the higher leaves, and and over generations, giraffes will get longer necks. So you can get this idea in your head, and you go, okay, that solves it, that makes sense, except it doesn't really. It, it yeah. doesn't explain how you go from a, a an amoeba to a whale. Right, exactly. But it if, pretends to explain it. Yeah, the problem with that really is that until a, a system is completely in place, it doesn't help an organism, it actually hurts it. So, for example, if you have um, a half a wing, right? I start out with no wings and I just get a half a wing. Well, that's not going to help you. If you have uh, part lung, part gills, that's not going to help you. It's actually going to probably kill you because you don't have what's uh, appropriately there. So this whole idea that things gradually developed into something new is actually quite foolish. I use the illustration of a car junkyard and I say, or a vehicle junkyard, and I say, um, if you apply uh, uh, evolutionary principles to a vehicle junkyard, you assume that what started out as a unicycle suddenly developed on its own into a bicycle, then a tricycle, then it goes to maybe a Fiat, uh, that, uh, I like <laughs> Fiats, uh, then to a Chevrolet Corvette, and ultimately it gets to a BMW, because right. that's the ultimate driving machine. Uh -huh. And then you have offshoots to cars, or to uh, trucks and airplanes. Right. Or you can say, no, each one of those individual things was designed by a careful designer who was very wise and skillful. So what is the more reasonable conclusion? And I think, uh, again, we have to say that, you know, there's the common sense approach to this, which is what we're taking right now. But there's also the, you can look into the science, folks. This is, this is not like scientists aren't equally troubled by this, but they just... Uh, many of them are so uh, in invested in a certain worldview, they wouldn't dare mention uh, anything that might get them in trouble. But the fact of the matter is, I just had at Socrates in the City, we just had um, uh, uh, David Berlinski. He mm. wrote a book called, uh, he's written a number of books on this stuff. He's an agnostic, and he recognizes that so called Darwinian evolution is just lunacy. I mean, it's not like they have no points, but at the end of the day, you would have to conclude, sorry, this is, it, it, it can't happen that way because the levels of complexity, if you ignore the levels of complexity, you say, well, I could see stuff happening. But then when you get down into how an eye develops or the idea of flight or any of these things, you, you realize that we're so far from actually being able to show that uh, that we've got to be we've got to be honest about it, and uh, you know this doesn't prove God, but if you're honest, 
you'd have to say, well, we've, they've been selling this soap for 150 plus years, and the more we learn, the more difficult it is to think that, that, that it really happened. But actually, what I love is that even before you get to evolution is the idea of, because uh, evolution presupposes life, and you say, okay, life, natural selection, but how do you get from non-life to life? That's even more crazy. Mm. That really is like going to a junkyard and expecting the stuff, the wind, to create a, a working vehicle or something like that. Like, yeah. you, you, you know, there, there's no natural selection. It's just wind and rain and, and random processes. And you're saying, oh, we'll, we'll, end up, we'll end up with a cell eventually. It's like, no, you actually won't. You'll never end up with a cell. In fact, if you start with a cell, the cell will break down, like, which is what you just said. Um, should we talk more about that worldview? Because there are three worldviews. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. But but Vegas is the is the random right. That's the, that. It's chance. That's why it's Vegas. It's chance. You just kind of it's a crap shoot. I'm gonna right. throw the craps the the uh, dice down. Right. And, oh wow, I got seven. You know, but uh, it doesn't work that way in real life. Okay, so uh, one of the things I, I mentioned yeah. in there is uh, a hummingbird looking at a sophisticated helicopter, and two hummingbirds are there, and the one hummingbird says, "Well, you know, it's big, it's powerful, it can definitely go up and down and move around a lot better than a regular airplane." Hey, I'll give it an A for effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you think of of what it takes to design a helicopter, right? You know, human beings didn't do that until oh, I don't know fairly recently in history, and, and, and obviously the same with airplanes, and then you look at something like a hummingbird, which is so small and so efficient and so magnificent, um, it, it's, it's mind-bending. Let, let's talk about um, the second thing, and the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So Hollywood, what is the Hollywood, when you say Hollywood, what do you mean? What's the worldview there? The worldview there is basically the force of Star Wars. I mean, I use that. Um, it started out uh, a number of years, actually, by the way, one little interesting piece of information. The uh, original Star Wars film debuted in 1977. Do you know how many theaters it opened in? No. 32. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. We need to fact check that. We'll be right back <laughs> talking to George Saris. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Folks, welcome back. I'm talking to my friend George Saris, S-A-R-R-I-S. That's a Greek name. Uh, the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, The Quest to Discover if God is Real. So when you talk about Hollywood, um, you say that's kind of like the force. Uh, it's this impersonal force. It's not the God of the Bible. Um, but you were just saying that in 77, when Star Wars uh, arrived, it only opened on 32 screens. Right. But it became so popular because it really combined sort of this idea of science and philosophy and Eastern mysticism. And it was right during the time when, in fact, I think George Lucas, if I'm not mistaken, was involved in um, Est. Uh, which well, was I, I wouldn't Earhart be surprised. something, whatever it was. Yeah. And um, so it's kind of his idea that, you know, and it's basically sort of a, a combination of Hinduism and Buddhism and, you know, a bunch of these Eastern mystic ideas, Zoroastrianism. So you have some of the, um, the, the, uh, the light and the dark are Zoroastrian, really. You've got a, a good being and you've got an evil being and they kind of are always fighting with one another, that type of thing. And uh, then it, it, it developed more when it became Transcendental Meditation. Everybody was involved in that in the 70s and then it became the New Age Movement. And so it just kind of has taken over as the basic idea of our culture today. In fact, uh, many of the people I'll talk to, I'll, I'll say, yeah, by the way, what kind of religious background do you have? Oh, I'm not religious. I'm, I'm spiritual. Yeah, it's the cliché Right. Of the century, folks. When you hear pe whenever I hear anybody speak a cliche, I die a little bit because it's so pathetic. It's a, it's an excuse. I mean, it's an excuse. It's a substitute for actual thinking. So it's embarrassing to me for the person when they say things like that because they've been told that they've been told that that's a safe thing to say and that ends the conversation. But part of the reason is because they can't really trust what they've been bro brought up with. Right. They can't trust the schools, they can't trust their churches unfortunately, right. of course. and they can't trust the government. And so right. they're they're really expressing I don't really know where I am. That's right. That's that, what's and happening. And that's the more generous way of looking at it and you're right to point it out because I think and this is why I'm glad you wrote this book Searching for Truth. I think there's so many people uh 
They have basic questions, and they're not getting them answered. They're afraid to... I wrote a, a, a series of books years, 20 years ago, called Everything Always Want to Know About God, But We're Afraid to Ask, a similar concept that people are afraid to ask, whether it's the priest or the minister or their born-again neighbor. They're just... They're afraid they're going to get it with both barrels, and so they kind of just are looking for clues in the culture, but they're not getting it. Right. And so that's why uh, people like you write books like Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. And you wrote, by the way, Atheism is Dead. Same kind of idea. Yes, in a lot that's of ways. it. That doesn't answer the questions that you do in this book, but it's, it deals with some of the same stuff. Yeah. But you answer the questions on a simple level because there are so many questions uh, uh, that you you know you're 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 actually answering the questions. Uh, in this book, and when you talk about the default mode that has come into American culture, you just said it is Hollywood, and it means it says, "Well, I believe there's some force, there's some spirituality. I just don't know what it is. Uh, I'm a nice guy. I want to be in tune with good spirituality. It, it's very sloppy. It's it, it doesn't ask anything of anyone, and it also is not logical mm. uh, at the end of the day. But uh, it's the best some people can do, and that's why Oprah Winfrey was so popular and why uh, a lot of these versions of New Age stuff are so popular because people are just, they're lost, but they know they need something. Nothing, you know, the brave atheist who says, I believe in absolutely nothing, you know, first of all, that's preposterous, but I'm saying that most people just aren't like that. Most people know there's something, and because churches and Christians maybe haven't sufficiently answered that, they kind of gravitate toward what you're talking about in Hollywood. Yeah, um, a lot of the people that say they're religious, but, or they're not religious, but they're spiritual, it's not that they're atheist, but they just have real questions. Right. And they're, they're looking for somebody or some group that can tell them answers. In fact, sometimes they're wondering if there even are answers. And uh, so what I was trying to do here was say, yes, there really are. Um, the problem with uh, that whole Eastern mystic idea is that they're basically philosophical musings by thoughtful people, right. but that's it. There's nothing transcendent about it. Right. In fact, one other little interesting thing that I found out in uh, my research, which I was kind of surprised at, um, you know, we've often said uh, the, uh, the tomb of Jesus was empty, but all the other people, they died. Do you know where Muhammad is buried? I do not. He's buried in Medina, Saudi Arabia. There's I was going to say... I was, I was pretty sure it was Grant's tomb. It's not Grant's tomb. <laughs> no, it's not Grant's no. tomb. But they act, there actually is a grave of Muhammad. It's protected by uh, people that are, I guess, whatever they do, they protect it, you know, watch it over. It's a, a covered uh, uh, tomb, and that's where his body is. Uh, Confucius is buried in the cemetery of Confucius in Khufu, Shandong Province, China. Buddha was actually cremated in, I think it's Kandagar, I can't remember what the name of it, Kashindagar, Kish, whatever it is. And, yeah, thank you. But uh, he was actually cremated, and the bones, because when you cremate someone, the bones don't get destroyed, were given out to various people, and so they are relics, there are relics around of Buddha. Then, of course, you have Jesus, who, oh, he wasn't there. Hey, what, whatever happened to him? <laughs> it, it, it is kind of amazing because that's, this is one of the, I mean, I always say this, and this is, again, why I wanted to have you on and uh, point people to your book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, is because I think there are a lot of people who really have good questions, and some of them are sort of believers, and some of them aren't quite, and some of them are definitely believers, but they still have questions, and when somebody asks them, they don't know what to say. And I think it's important for us to understand what you just said. There are good answers to these things. We shouldn't pretend that, hey, who's to say? There are good answers, uh, and one of the classic things, which I know I've written about in two of my books, is the, res the evidence, I never thought mm. I'd be saying this, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is astonishing. In other words, it's one of those things that the more you look into it, the more you think, hey, wait a minute, I think he did maybe rise from the dead. Logic will lead you to that. Now, it can't force you to believe it, but what I find interesting is that we live in a culture that pretty much says, listen, truth is whatever you want it to be, and if you look too closely, it's just confusing. And, 
And, and you and I have both found the opposite. We found that, no, 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 if you actually are searching for the truth, you'll be shocked. You'll be absolutely shocked at how many solid answers you'll get if you're really interested. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. The author is my guest, George Saris. We'll be right back. Folks, welcome back. Talking to my friend, George Saris, whose book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. George, I want to talk to you way more about everything that we're talking about, but I do want to ask you mm -hmm. in this shorter segment, when did you find faith? How did that happen for in your life? I, um, I grew up, uh, a couple of interesting things. I didn't find out until I was in my 40s that my mother's father, toward the end of his life, was ordained as a Greek Orthodox priest. It was amazing to me. Nobody told me that. It's kind of fascinating. But I grew up, we went to Protestant churches because when he first came over from the old country, he brought his children to Episcopal churches because they didn't have any Orthodox churches at the time. In New Hampshire? No, this was in upstate New York. Upstate, that, that's called, where you were, upstate New York. Yeah, a small yeah. town called Johnstown, New York. And um, anyway, uh, so I grew up in a Protestant background, but I always wondered, is there a God? I think there's a God. Jesus, I'm not too sure what he did. Anyway, so I went to college at Northwestern University from 1966 to 1970. And uh, there was a professor there who seemed to have as his goal to destroy the faith of any students. And uh, so I just kind of bought into what he said. I mean, he brought up some questions about the Bible and stuff like that. And so I thought, well, it's not whatever's happening. And then at the end of my junior year in college, I met some Christians that had a different focus on life. They were part of a group called Campus Crusade for Christ. They've changed the name now to Crew. But... Um, they shared a little booklet with me. A man, in fact, the book is dedicated to Conrad Cook, who uh, was the person that actually changed my life by sharing that little booklet with me. But it, basically what it was saying is the reason you don't have power in your life, the reason you're not seeing God answer prayer, the reason you're not experiencing peace and joy, the reason you don't have answers is because you're trying to be the boss of your life instead of allowing God to be the boss. You're the servant, he's the boss. And when that happened, it was like, wow. And so then I decided I need to, to check out on the, the question that this professor had been challenging me with. And I found there were answers. And then there were more uh, questions. You know, the whole idea of evolution. I started looking at, wow, there are answers to these things. Uh, is the Bible true? Wow, there are answers to all this stuff. It was exciting. And so then uh, I graduated from college, uh, worked with Campus Crusade for Christ for about four years in their uh, headquarters when it was in California, then went to seminary, uh, got an MDiv at uh, Gordon-Conwell Seminary. And while I was in seminary, I thought, you know, there's a need for godly individuals to get into positions of influence within secular institutions. And I was interested in uh, the media, and so I thought, well, I'll just get into the media. Why is it that the media is communicating so much junk all the time? Because they're junky people. And what you need is to have some people that can actually have good thoughts, godly thoughts, that are producing the programming. And so uh, at the time, I decided to basically be a tent maker missionary. And so I was uh, working in the Boston area at that time, and then in 1991 moved to New York. And uh, that's how I ended up meeting you and working yeah trying to share my faith. But it's just amazing to me that this happened in college. I just love when I hear stories like this, that somebody's in college and suddenly the lights go off or the, 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 or the, the bulb goes off and you start to, I mean, I, it happened to me after college, mm. but that moment when you realize, wait a minute, I, there are tons of great answers and books and stuff. And I didn't, I had no idea that all these objections that people say, well, what about this? What about that? There are satisfying answers to these things. And so I started reading all these different books. And as far as I'm concerned, I've, I've written some of those books now. And this book that you've written is one of those books. It's called Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Uh, it answers all kinds of questions that everyone uh, has, you know, did Jesus really rise from the dead? What about this thing called pain? Why would God allow pain to exist? Uh, all of these important questions have great answers. We will continue talking at the end of hour one, uh, but my guest is George Saris, and the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Folks, welcome back. I continue my conversation uh, now in hour two with my friend George Saris, George W. Saris, in case you want to find George 
uh, George's website, georgewsaris.com. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, the quest to discover if God is real. And so, George, you and I, we've discovered that he is real, Mm. but the big news, and that's what you have in this book, is that anyone who wants to can discover the same thing. This is not just for a few religiously minded people. Every human being has these basic questions. Yeah, who and I who think am even, I? Why am I here? Right. I think right now people are beginning to ask those questions. For a while they weren't asking them. Everything was going fine. You know, we've got this wonderful culture where, you know, I make money, I do this, I do that. But all of a sudden everything is falling apart. And so as it's falling apart, people are beginning to wonder, are there answers? And if there are, where are those answers? And they're beginning to, I think, be open to wanting to know them. You are, you are singing my song. I've been saying this for, at least for the last year, mm. that things have gotten so bad that a lot of just normal people going through their lives are saying, hey, wait a minute, what the heck is happening? Something's wrong. Where do I look for answers? And the, the level of uh, evil and confusion mm. is so strong that people who wouldn't ordinarily be inclined to look for a spiritual solution are saying, I, I, th- this feels evil, and, and I wonder if there's a God who has, the, it, maybe he could be the only answer to this, because it's not a political thing, it's not a, what, there's something bigger going on. So I agree with you that there has never been, uh, really in our lifetimes, a stronger uh, desire on the part of just just average folks, like what is happening and are there answers? Where would I look for those answers? Yeah, I think that's exactly true. It's kind of interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up or I went to college from 1966 to 70 during the height of the Vietnam War era and uh, the unrest that we had. It was bad back then. I mean, there was rioting in the streets. The, the whole culture was really starting to fall apart. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get this Jesus freaks. Jesus people, like, where in the world do they come from? I'm convinced that, that what God is doing right now is shaking the culture and shaking the Christian church. Yeah. Uh, I've said for many, many years that the evangelical church, which is what I'm a part of, um, is a mile wide and an inch deep. Yeah. And I was praying. I said, God, I think you need to make it a half mile wide and a foot deep. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what he's doing right yeah. now. He's actually shaking the culture and shaking the Christian church. Yeah, no, listen, I we haven't discussed this, uh, you and I, but I agree absolutely, and I've been saying roughly the same thing, um, th- that over the decades, uh, we've drifted and drifted. In my book, Letter to the American Church, I talk about this idea that we've gotten so obsessed with, we say, it's all about faith, it's all about what I believe, and you think, well, yeah, but if you don't live out your faith, then you don't really have faith. You can't fool God and say, well, I have these intellectual beliefs, but I, it's just not reflected in how I live. And I think that we are at a time where the church, as you just said, is being shaken and the culture is being shaken. And the only example that we could go back to would be the late 60s. Everything seemed to be falling apart. And enough people turned to Jesus. It becomes the Jesus movement, the, the, uh, uh, our, our friend uh, um, uh, Greg Laurie has a film out now called Jesus Revolution that there was a moment when things were so bad that people were open to this idea of Jesus. And I do think that we're at that moment ag- again. And in, in some ways it's worse. I mean, in some ways it really seems to be so dark uh, in the culture without us even having to get into specifics that your average person is saying, you know, what's it all about? What, what is going on? I was kind of drifting along, like you just said. Things were sort of okay, and and yet now... Uh, what I took for granted for decades is is going away rapidly. What do I do? Where do I turn? And you and I would say, uh, the God of the Bible. So in your book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, you you dismiss the uh, the idea of Vegas and Hollywood. Uh, we've talked about that. So Bethlehem, um, I think for a lot of people, you were one of those people, and I was one of those people, who were like, well, I'm okay with the idea of God, but ah, the Jesus thing seems mm-hmm. a little... Maybe that's too specific or something like that. So where do you take it? Well, one of the things I, I mentioned is about, um, is Jesus the Messiah? That's a big question. And, you know, because you've you got a whole realm of Jewish people that don't believe that, right? Uh, it suddenly struck me, there's really only three things you need to know to point out a specific individual in the entire world. 
and then four if you want to have an extra confirmation. For example, I am the only person in the history of the world, before, currently, or ever at will be, who's named George W. Saris, born in a small upstate New York town between the end of World War II and the beginning of the 2000 uh, millennium. There's nobody else in the history of the world that fits that. And then a little confirmation is that I wrote a book in 2023 titled Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, The Quest to Discover if God is Real. Nobody else fits that. Well, you look back at Jesus, all you need to know is, what's his name? He's from the line of David. I'm from the line of Saris. Where was he born? Bethlehem. Very specific that it says that in Scripture. When was he born? You can get some specific, uh, I, I talk about Isaac Newton, who points out actually the specific date that Jesus was supposed to have risen from the dead. But even in more general terms, you have the, the prophecy from Jacob that says, before the, or uh, uh, the Messiah will come when the, the, um, uh, the ruler's staff is taken from Judah. That happened in 70 AD. Prior to that, there still was a ruler's staff in Israel, but when the second temple was destroyed completely, that was done. So that means that the Messiah had to be from the line of David. He had to be uh, uh, coming sometime prior to 70 AD prior, in Bethlehem. Prior to 70 Pri AD. Prior to Obviously, 70 AD. right. And uh, then the confirmation is the virgin birth that specifically talks that this person is going to come, he's going to be born of a virgin. Well, there's nobody else in the history of the world that fits that. It's really pretty phenomenal. Well, actually, it's interesting because a lot of people would say, oh, that's mythical, or they, they just would, would, wouldn't believe it. But the point is that uh, th there's no one who even claims that. Uh, and it is specific when you read it in the scripture. It's really clear that it's not just a young woman, because when they referred to a young woman, they specifically meant a virgin young woman, because if you were not a virgin, you were no longer uh, a young woman. You were now married or you were whatever. And yeah, there, there's so many things. Again, if somebody dares to look into this stuff, they're going to be shocked at how much evidence there is. Because if you want to kind of glide through life, you can kind of pretend, well, there's no evidence. There's a lot of different points of view. Well, I dare you, if you want to know, to look into these things. I mean, you can start with George's book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. But if you, if you really are hungry to know, first of all, can I know, right? Because we say, like, is there truth? Well, even if there is truth, the first question would be like, hey, if there is a thing called truth and about the God, and I, can I know that truth? Or is it just some truth that I, I, that's not accessible to me? Uh, and that's part of what you deal with as well. I, I want to uh, get back to the Isaac Newton thing, just because I love these sorts of things. <laughs> I mentioned that we have Jeannie Constantino who's going to be speaking at Socrates and City on February 28th, and she gets into this really cool stuff that you can kind of begin to, to pull out from these ancient documents and stuff. And we can learn and learn. We can keep learning things that, you know, but so what did, what, did you remember uh, in the book what you write about Isaac Newton? Yeah, Isaac Newton actually wrote more books uh, or more on theology than he did on science. Really kind of phenomenal. Right. He was a, a brilliant man, obviously, um, but then also very much a very religious person who was committed to the scriptures. Right. And so he looked at um, when the, uh, there's a, a, um, uh, a comment that, that Ezra left to go to the to start the uh, to rebuild the temple, right? And then there's a prophecy relating to that of when the Messiah will come and when he will be cut off, right. and uh, so he says, okay, I've got two dates. One of them is if it if it starts when Ezra left Jerusalem or left, yeah, uh, no Babylon, wherever he was, or when he arrived in Jerusalem. Okay, now hang so, on. We're going to put a pin in that. Ladies and gentlemen, in show business, we call this a cliffhanger. We'll be right back talking to George Saris. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Don't go away. Welcome back, folks. Talking to George Saris. Uh, the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So, George, we were just talking about, uh, in the book, you talk about how Isaac Newton, probably the greatest scientist who ever lived, um, wrote more about the Bible than he wrote about science. And you were specifically talking about uh, he was trying to figure out when exactly was Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. And he just did a, 
uh, kind of an extraordinary dive into this. So where, where does he come out? You were just talking yeah. about it. Uh, let me just read this one second. It says, for uh, Newton, the prophecy referred to in, from Daniel referred to 490 years from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the time of the crucifixion of Christ. He had to he had an extensive knowledge of ancient history and identified the decree as occurring in the year 458 B.C. Now, depending on whether the prophecy began when Ezra left Babylon or when he arrived in Jerusalem to start building, he offered two dates for when the crucifixion was prophesied to occur, A.D. 33 or A.D. 34. One of the two dates generally accepted by scholars for the crucifixion of Christ on our modern cal calendars is Friday, April 3rd, A.D. 33. Well, what's interesting about that, Jeannie Constantinou, whom I mentioned as my Socrates and City guest on February 28th, she talks about this too. Mm. And it's so interesting because she says probably it seems like Jesus was 37 uh, or 38 when he was crucified, not 30 or 33 or something. And look, at the end of the day, who cares? It is what it is. But it's fascinating to me how much we can learn. The more you dig in the more you can discover these things. And of course, so many people have gone before us and, and asked these, uh, these, these vital questions. So what, what else do you go into uh, in the book? Uh, I know you talk about the idea of, I mean, one of the things that people say, again, it's one of these cliches. They say, oh, the Bible was changed in the Middle Ages by the monks. Okay, that's not true. I've written extensively about how it's ridiculously untrue but you answer that in this book because a lot of people have been told this. Yeah, it's really kind of interesting. If you look at how the Bible was communicated, one of the things to keep in mind is that the, there were official copies and then unofficial copies of the ancient manuscripts. And the Hebrew Bible, um, the oldest manuscript, I think you mentioned this in your book as well, the oldest manuscript that we had prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was like, 10 something uh, AD. Yeah. So the Dead Sea Scrolls was a thousand years earlier. They found 95% of it was exactly the same. The other 5% were primarily slips of the pen, uh, changes in place names. For example, we have Cape Canaveral that changed to Cape Kennedy that changed back to Cape Canaveral. So that's what they were doing. And, uh, uh, but anyway, those were student copies. Those were not the official copies. Right. If you look at what the official copies, the detail of what the scribes had to do, do you know what the middle letter of the Pentateuch is? Uh, I do not. Is it, uh, let me guess, G? Just kidding. Uh, no, I, I don't. Think I think it's I, Leviticus I've... chapter 11, verse 42. I think that's the middle letter is in that book. Do you know that how many... Letters, now this is, you gotta remember, the Hebrew Old Testament has only consonants. Do you know how many consonants there are in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible? I do not. 400,945. 400,945 letters. 945 letters. And those are all consonants in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So what the scribes had to do was they had, to, they had this, I, I, I mentioned in my book, this extensive list of things they had to uh, follow through. But one of them was they had to count the number of letters, find the middle letter to make sure that they copied it correctly. Okay, so, so folks, what we're saying, think about this. They were so dedicated, so ultra, crazy dedicated to accuracy. We can't even imagine in our sloppy world uh, where there are typos in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every day, they were, they took the word of God so exceedingly seriously, it was so holy that changing one letter was sacrilegious. Right. In fact, there was a rule that said if the king walks in when the scribe is writing the name of God, the scribe has to ignore the king. That's how serious they took this thing. Do you know what the middle, or they have some interesting little things. When I was in seminary, I, in fact, I have it outside. I have a little uh, Hebrew Bible. And, uh, and I think it's Numbers chapter 25, verse 10. Uh, there's a letter, it's called a wow or vav, depending on which yeah. seminary you went to. It has a crack in it. If you look at the letter, it's got a little crack. And there's a little footnote, it's called a circlus. And on the bottom in Aramaic is a footnote that says, wow, cracked. They were so careful about how they transmitted the, uh, the, the text that if they noticed anything different, they would put a note for it. 
So some scribe happened to notice this one happened to be cracked. Wow, we got to make sure that we copy it exactly as it was that I received it. Again, I mean, the phenomenal. more you look into this, folks, and this is why, you know, I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis and Screwtape Letters about, you know, young atheist has to be very careful what books he reads <laughs> or whatever, because the more you look into this, the more you'll find you don't really have a leg to stand on because there are extraordinary answers to all these good and honest questions. So if you're looking for hope, there is hope, folks. Uh, there's more than hope. Uh, there's truth. The God of the Bible is real. He wants you to know him. He wants to bless you. He wants to love you. It's so beautiful, and we're living in a culture that says, nah, 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 nah. So we're here to say, nah, 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 to those voices and to say, if you're interested, you will be stunned. And, and, and this is a popular-level book. You wrote this for everybody. This right. is the kind of thing you can use... Uh, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a church group or as an outreach to say to people like, hey, will you, are you interested in, in knowing if there is a God? And, you know, uh, there's a book called Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Let's start there. Because you and I were saying that there is a hunger today. Mm. People want to know, listen, um, I just want to know, is there a reason that I'm here? Is life meaningless? Uh, what's going to happen in the future? Um, so, and George, but- yeah. I just say, looking at just how different the Bible is from the rest of religious literature. I, I mentioned the book, some of the other, um, the Vedas of Hinduism, uh, I think it's Hinduism, whatever they are, the Tripitaka of Buddhism. Most people have never even heard of them. The Bible, the extensive translation and the extensive distribution is phenomenal. Yo. In fact, yeah. one of the things I say in the book is, if I were God and I wanted to communicate to mankind who I am, what would I do? Well, number one, I'd want to have something that was in a physical form that could be transmitted from one culture to another, one generation to another, so it doesn't undergo decay. Okay. Number two, I'd want to specifically tell the people that I am the Lord. I am God. I'm the one that's doing this. Number three, I would want something that was uh, somehow set apart from all other literature by miracles or whatever. Well, you see the Bible, that's exactly what it does. And also, I would want something that dates from ancient times because I don't want something late like um, uh, Joseph Smith coming along in uh, the 1800s with the Book of Mormon. I want something that's going to be affecting people from the beginning of time. Well, the Bible fits that absolutely perfectly. And the other interesting thing about the Bible is its message about God loves you, which is a phenomenally different message than any other uh, religion. It's radical, and, we, and we've so much, uh, our whole culture is so suffused with that concept that we don't appreciate the radicalness of it. The idea right. that a God who created the universe, the judge of the world, loves you, knows you personally, actually loves you, that is as radical as it gets. Yeah. So much so that many people take it for granted and blow it off. And then the fact that this God actually came personally to tell you about who he was. That's what's so amazing. Because in the person of Christ, God didn't just send a messenger to say, hey, uh, I just want you guys to know uh, I'm, I'm God and this is what I'm like. He came himself. That's what is amazing about Christianity. It is. I mean, you know, people call it the greatest story ever told. It actually is. Right. Um, the, the the idea that he came, that he suffered, that he died, that he rose from the dead. I mean, the more you look at it, and this is why I want to encourage people, the more you look at it, the more it blesses you, the more it amazes you. Because, again, I think a lot of us, we, we live in a culture where we say, well, don't look too close. There, there are no good answers. Science has sort of disproved the Bible or whatever. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. And the more you look into it, the more you'll be astonished at how untrue it is and how you've been gaslit uh, and, and led astray. There's so much else in this book, uh, George. Please uh, stick around because I want uh, to get to more of it. Uh, you've got chapters, uh, Is the Bible God's Word? There's a question. Um, uh, is the Bible God's Word? How about pain and suffering? That's and another pain and big suffering big, is, is about as big as it gets. Uh, so uh, is the Bible God's word? When we come back, I want to talk about that. And then I want to get into the pain and suffering because that's the honest question that everyone mm. has. Because if you've suffered, if you've lost someone you love or whatever, you do ask the question, say, Lord, I don't get it. I don't, mm. I don't get it. If you're all loving and all powerful, 
Why would you allow this? And that's a good question. We'll be right back talking to George W. Saris. Folks, welcome back. Talking to the author of Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, my friend George Saris. Okay, George, one of the things that people often ask, like if you quote the Bible, they go like, Pfft, okay, you're quoting the Bible. How, so what? I mean, why are you quoting the Bible? And, and, and you know, the reason we're quoting the Bible is because we say it is the Word of God, and we believe that's what gives it this kind of ultimate authority. Um, but but w- how can we know whether it's the Word of God? Well, just looking at what it says, number one, it claims to be the Word of God, which is very unusual. The only other book, really, that claims to be the Word of God that is sort of historical uh, in a long term is the Quran. Uh, but that comes along at 600 AD. That's really, really late. You've got to have something a lot earlier if you're going to be actually impacting the entire world um, and generations, uh, all the generations. Uh, so God specifically says that it's from him. And then he's got uh, extensive miracles that are occurred, that um, things that occurred God, I, I go into uh, some specifics about Cyrus and uh, Babylon. You know, when, when uh, uh, Cyrus defeated Babylon, this is, if you've ever seen the, uh, the film Lord of the Rings, there's a one part where they go in and they blow up this uh, gate at Helm's Deep because they go through, uh, there, there's a, a water channel. I think that's where Tolkien got it from. Because what, what happened yes. with Cyrus, he realized that, Babylon was the greatest city of the ancient world, phenomenal city. And it was impregnable up until the time of World War II when you had um, uh, airplanes and you had uh, artillery that could destroy that kind of a a wall. Just phenomenal. Well, it also had the Euphrates River came into the, under the wall, into the city so that the people could actually have, they could withstand a siege for years. Right. Well, what, what Cyrus did was he diverted the water and he walked underneath the wall. And as he did, he took over the city with hardly any resistance. Just phenomenal. But that was predicted a couple of hundred years before he was even born. And there's a number of other Now, uh, when you say like that, that. That, that, that was predicted, in other words, in the Bible, it says this is going to happen hundreds of years before Cyrus does it. And there are innumerable examples in Scripture. Again, if you're honest and you look at it, 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 it'll boggle your mind because you'll say, I don't understand how it could get this kind of thing right over and over. And, uh, you know, even if there's some you don't believe, there's so many, uh, because this stuff was written, you know, 15 centuries B.C., 14 centuries B.C. I mean, this is a long time ago. This is a thousand years before classical Greece. And there's all of this stuff that was written. Uh, it's so beautiful. You got Alexander the Great, who dis, uh, defeats the city of Tyre, which is phenomenal. Uh, I, I tell a little bit about that, and I, I'm not sure if you mentioned that in your book. Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay, the, the city of Tyre was on an island. It, it actually, it, I, um, I think it might have been Ezekiel that predicted that it's going to be destroyed. Well, you have a city on the land, and then they have the second city that's on an island about a half mile off, right? So uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes in, destroys the city on the land, but the people move to Tyre. And the specific uh, uh, comment that Isaiah or uh, Ezekiel makes, I think it might have been, maybe it's Isaiah, whatever, anyway, is that the land will be scraped, okay? And it's going to be thrown into the sea. Tyre is going to be thrown into the sea, and there's going to scrape it. Well, Alexander the Great comes along a couple of hundred years later, um, and he wants to uh, offer some sacrifices on a temple on the island city. The people just blow him off. So he tells his army to literally scrape with their shields all the dirt that's on the uh, mainland city, throw all the rubble into it. He made a causeway from the mainland to the island, marches over with his army, and defeats it completely. Phenomenal. That happened hundreds of years after the prophecy was done, and a very specific, extremely specific in terms of the details. So the I Bible did, is just amazing. I did not know that, uh, and I look forward to finding that uh, in this book, parts of which I've read all the way through. You know that? Parts of which I read all the way through, but that part I did not get to. But th- look, this kind of stuff is at least fascinating because uh, there's so many people that just think, oh, who's to say? Who's to-? Listen, folks, you can just look into this, and again, the more you look into it, now the biggest question of all hmm. um, 
always has to do with pain and suffering. Uh, that's the question that every honest person has. So h- how do we uh, answer that? Yeah, that is a definitely an important question. In fact, um, in my experience, I, I remember talking with uh, a Jewish um, producer one time uh, for a commercial that I was uh, working with. And um, he said, well, how can you possibly believe in a God who would allow the, the uh, f- millions of Jews to be killed in, in Nazi Germany? Anger. Well, that's a lot of people have. Or others that are suffering because of why would God allow birth defects? I mean, I talk about one uh, birth defect. There's this, these two people. They're called conjoined twins, what people say Siamese twins. It's actually conjoined twins. Uh, Laura and Reba Chappelle. Uh, one of them is significantly taller than the other. They're connected at their head. One faces this way. The other faces that way. How yeah, could if, God if you allow need, that? If you need evidence to be angry at the so-called God who would allow this, I mean, you can understand why people have this emotion. Right. Uh, how about torture? Why would God allow people to be tortured? That's where someone purposefully inflicts pain. That's amazing. Well, so I discuss all of those kinds of things in the book. Well, now, let me get, we're, I'll, we're gonna, I'll answer a couple. We're going to go to a, a break, but I want to say again, folks, the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. This is important stuff. People are looking for answers. The author is George W. Saris, S-A-R-R-I-S. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. Talking to George Saris. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So, George, you were just referring to a couple of things that are, they are genuinely <clears throat> honest objections to this idea of the God of the Bible, because you say these things are so horrible, it doesn't make sense. If there were a God, surely he would not allow those things. I always say there's no easy answer to that. I, myself, uh, I, you know, anytime anybody gives an easy answer to it, you say, well, look, you, you don't appreciate the pain and the whatever. There, there are no easy answers, but there are answers. So what, what are some of the things we can say? Yeah, um, pain is real. And to try to minimize that is not a good idea because, uh, yeah, pain is really real. It's physical sometimes, sometimes psychological. And sometimes the psychological, emotional pain can be even worse than the physical pain of something coming along. Um, uh, Anyway, but there are a number of reasons why I think God allowed it. Number one is free will. I mean, God chose that he wanted mankind to have a free will. That's extremely important because you can can make, he could have made mankind a robot and said, uh, and programmed it. So do you love me? Yes, I love you. You are absolutely wonderful. That kind of, that would have been a total sham. Of well, what because God could have done. then that's not love. We understand this is the conundrum. Right. But the second thing is God has placed a limit on the amount of pain any individual or any culture will be allowed to suffer. And that's extremely important because there is in reality, no such thing as unbearable pain from God's perspective. Now, we may think that the limit that God put on is too, too, uh, too wide, but from God's perspective, there is a limit. At any point in physical suffering, uh, at some point, the area of pain will go numb, the person will go unconscious, or ultimately will die. So there is a limit that God has placed on suffering, physical suffering that any one individual uh, might okay, have. Okay, that, uh, that doesn't give me much comfort, but please continue. <laughs> That's right. Well, it actually should give it a little bit of uh, comfort because it means that God is not going to allow you to, he knows exactly how much you can handle and he'll never go beyond that. I think that's extremely important for us to keep in mind. And God has given loving people, loving medicines to be able to deal with pain, physical pain, that kind of thing. But anyway, I I deal with a couple of different reasons why God might do it. One is obviously to develop character. Uh, When I was on crusade staff uh, back in the early 1970s, I just gotten there. There was this man uh, going around with a woman. Uh, he was in a wheelchair. This woman was pushing him along. He was wearing weird stuff, looked kind of weird, and I always felt sorry for him. Until one day, he's the person that's speaking at our staff devotions. I was shocked. And he explained that he had been a competition diver, that he had do- dove into the, the pool, broke his back, and he became a quadriplegic. Or paraplegic, I think, at that point. Um, And then he said, and Eric, I was blown away. He said, that was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. 
Because if it hadn't been for that accident, my life would have been pursuing trivial things. As a result of that accident, my life has done significant things. He and his wife, the, the woman that was pushing him along, was, uh, they were some of the top linguists in the world because of that accident. He then pursued something significant. In fact, he wore these weird outfits. They were all given to him by heads of state at different places around the world. So it provided direction. Why did God allow that to happen? To provide direction for that particular person's life. I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting because the, 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 there's no question that we don't, nobody looks for suffering, but oftentimes the worst thing that happens to you in retrospect, you think, if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have turned that corner to God or to whatever, and I, I don't know where, I don't want to think where I'd be today. Um, the other thing, and I don't know if you go into it in the, in the book Searching for Truth that I'm holding here, but... The idea that in the Christian faith, God sends his son into the world to suffer and to die, to be with us in suffering and in dying, and no other religion deals with it that way. And that's my, amazing. My, uh, my dad owned a restaurant. All Greeks own restaurants. All Greeks are philosophers, <laughs> right? As you know. Right. And uh, my dad, when I was a little boy, I had to... I, I worked in my, my dad's restaurant, right? Like everybody else, their kids, their whole family works in the restaurant. I had to clean the toilets. You have never seen such dirty toilets as when people come in in a public place and leave them horribly dirty. But my father would go in and clean it before he had me clean it. He would teach me by doing it himself. And so I thought to myself a number of years ago, why did Jesus come and have to die on the cross? Because he wanted to say, hey, look, guys, I'm not just telling you to go clean the toilet. I'm not telling you to experience suffering. I will experience that same suffering probably to a greater degree than you ever even considered because I want to show you that I love you and that it's okay. It's part of my plan, and there are purposes that I have for that. I tell you, the depths, when you, when you just think about all of this stuff, and again, that, that's to me the beauty of... of the Christian faith, and if you're writing this book about the Christian faith, is that there are answers. And, you, you know, we, we don't have cavalier answers, but there are answers. And I'll say this, and this is kind of the point of my book is Atheism Dead on mm. another level, is that let's say you say, well, I'm not, I don't buy all that stuff. Well, you've got a problem because the other side of this, in other words, if you say, well, there's no God, what God, is infinitely less plausible. Right. In other words, you, you might say, well, I don't, I'm not buying your answers. Well, whose answers are you buying? Because if you're buying the idea that we emerged uh, through random processes and that we just got here because of nothing, it's just random accidental stuff, that's lunacy. And the more we learn from science, the more we know that is absolute lunacy. Um, the idea that life has no meaning, nobody lives that way. Nobody can dare to face a world with no meaning, where your life is meaningless, the love you have for your children or whatever is just, you know, just hormones and just chemicals designed to prepare. No one can face that. And so I, I, I want to challenge people and say, look, if you uh, aren't satisfied with these answers, tell me what, what are your answers? And inevitably, I think people get uncomfortable at that point because they, they're, they're happy to say, well, I'm just going to hang here in the middle while you're being intellectually dishonest. We're going to be right back. Final segment with George Saris. Uh, you can find him at georgewsaris.com. Uh, the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, The Quest to Discover if God is Real. We'll be right back. Folks, I'm talking to George Saris. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So, George, we're talking about the thorniest of the thorny issues, um, suffering uh, the misery in the world, uh, people really suffer. And I can see, I want to say, I, I get how people get angry and they just want to walk away from the idea of God. Uh, they don't get it. But you were just uh, uh, adding something. Yeah, interestingly, one of the reasons God has it is to demonstrate his power and his grace. I mentioned Captain, actually I didn't mention his name, but it's Captain McDaniels was a, a prisoner of war in, in um, North Vietnam, tortured for six years. He said when he came out of that, that was the greatest time in his life. He had experienced a closeness with God that he never had before, 
and he was amazed. Laura and Reba Chappelle, the conjoined twins, somebody asked them, uh, are you, would you like to be separated? They said, oh, why would you ever want to do that? You destroy two people's lives. God is able to give grace to anyone who's going through trouble. Well, see, that this is a big one because, again, no rational person wants to suffer. But if you understand how much God loves you, you understand that he's going to walk with you and give you grace through whatever you're going through. And people right now listening to this program, they're going through stuff. Mm. And I want to exhort you, turn to him. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Ask him to draw you closer. It can be so beautiful. Uh, don't miss that. Don't miss that. I, I just, uh, George, I'm just so glad that you wrote the book because I know that there are tons of people that are hungry um, for this. Let's end. We just got a minute or two mm. uh, to end on a lighter note here. Um, you have done voiceovers. We, we would recognize your voice. Who are some of the, the, what are some of the commercials where your voice is on TV? Well, the, the one right now that is the, the most popular is uh, Puffs Tissues. If you see <laughs> Puffs Tissues, um, the uh, Puffs Plus Lotion, it's, uh, it started out a number of years ago with uh, little Dakota's nose was quivering in fear because she thought an ordinary tissue was near. The fiery tissue made her nose, nose sore and red, but Dad slayed the problems with uh, Puffs Plus Lotion instead. Anyway, the, the, tagline, <laughs> the tagline is, a nose in need deserves puffs indeed. Unbelievable. So if you see any of those television commercials or radio commercials, I'm the voice. And if you hate those commercials, don't hate George. <laughs> He's just trying to make a living. All right, come on. Come That's on. That's right. But you, no, but you have done stuff for, uh, I don't know, with Burger King. or I was trying to remember because right. you, you, you and I have known each other so many years. But you've done, it's just an amazing thing, the whole voice over world, that people hear these voices and they don't know. Well, you know, I, I think of myself sometimes as John the Baptist, the voice crying out in the wilderness. Nobody knows who you are. Yeah. They may hear your voice, but yeah. they don't know anything about you. Right. And it's kind of a, a nice thing. I can go to places and nobody is say, oh, wow, that's George. Well, maybe that's not a nice thing. But anyway, yeah. they never know anything. You know, right. I can go to church. Nobody knows what I do. Uh, they can hear my voice, but they didn't uh, do that. I've done a lot of industrial films where that's even more. Right. That um, unless you happen to be the person in that industry watching that video, right. you never know it. Right. Well, uh, it, it's just it's just extraordinary that you've been doing this for so many years, and you have written books, you've done ministry. Uh, I want to say to people again that I, I think we are living at a time, we said this earlier, where people are just really hungry mm. for answers, uh, and I want to say that uh, George's book would be a spectacular place to start. Uh, you know, we answered some of the questions, what... what is there a God? There's a question. Uh, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Uh, how close is the Bible of today to the original Bible? These are all good questions. And if you want answers, folks, in this and other books, you can find real answers. This book is Searching for the Truth, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. And my guest has been my friend George Saris. George, thank you for writing the book, and thanks for coming into the studio. It is a privilege, and thank you for giving me that privilege. Folks, this is your daily reminder to please go to MyPillow.com or MyStore.com and to get huge savings, use the code ERIC. If you don't believe me, here are some celebrity friends. Mama said to use the code ERIC. Use the code ERIC. ERIC. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.